Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. And today we are welcoming uh, the incredible Philip Sahagan uh, to the show. Philip is a martial arts world champion. He's been a semifinalist on America's Got Talent. He's worked for and done a lot of cool things with Cirque du Soleil, toured with Tina Turner. Uh, you practice American Kempo, kickboxing, wushu, shalom and kung fu, all this stuff. I'm glad to have you on here, Philip. How are you guys? How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. And yourself? I'm doing good. I uh, it's one of these things too. Where I started the podcast. I, the first couple of guests I had were everyone from like Richard Norton uh, to Keith Cook to Chris Casabasa. It was very centered towards martial artists and different champions, Cynthia Rothrock and people like that. And uh, I, I kind of outreached. I did stuff with conservation, law enforcement, all these different backgrounds. And then I'm just kind of circling back into the martial arts world and. I know you and I have been talking on and off since the, the pandemic trying to get this organized, but to finally have you on here is actually really cool. Woohoo. Well, I'm glad to be on Spirit Talk and thank you very much. A lot of those names you mentioned were names I heard growing up. So pretty cool to uh, hear them again. I have to go back and listen to those episodes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's well, six two, and I kind of want to jump into it. I mean, obviously with your upbringing, both your mom and your dad are prolific in martial arts with their different backgrounds and pedigrees. Was there ever a point with you growing up that you, you felt you, you couldn't do martial arts, like was, or did they give the option as parents? Like, Hey, you, you don't want to do, if you don't want to do what we want to do, it's okay. But this is what we're, this is what we're working with here. I definitely don't remember an option. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember any options on the table. You know, really just my earliest memories were centered around our family school. Cause by the time they had the keys to the school, I was five years old. Um, and anything before that is just kind of foggy in the memory. Although they did tell me as a baby, I was in the stroller in different studios and, and training places. Um, have early memories of seeing my father compete in um, fighting competitions and thinking, well, that's strange. Why is dad over there doing that? <laughs> but it was young enough to not even comprehend what I was uh, seeing at the time. It is fascinating too, because a lot of those people you, I've mentioned before, like when they their their reactions or their interactions with martial arts growing up, usually it's a family orientated, and a lot of them have always said, growing up watching Bruce Lee uh, or Jackie Chan or all this stuff. And I know you have a kind of connection with Jackie Chan doing the show in China, um, yeah. but as as a kid, as you get older through like the grade school and all that stuff, was there a specific martial artists out there or is this is this solely based on what your parents are doing or maybe black belt magazine or inside kung fu magazine like what other aspects of the martial arts world kind of filtered into your life well i think in the 80s and 90s there was a huge media boom of martial arts just in general <laughs> although the training was maybe hard and um I guess something I enjoyed, but, you know, sometimes the family was, was critical of how you perform. So therefore, you know, it starts to get tough really fast. You do draw inspiration, though, from media and those around. And I'm talking about and nothing to be specific, uh, meaning there was not one dominating figure that I was like, wow, that's amazing. But, you know, I'm a kid. Ninja Turtles, yep. <laughs> three ninjas, uh, Power Rangers were later. Um even Hercules and Xena, like it was just so much media that actually I did not realize what I was doing wasn't normal. Does that make sense? Because yeah. there was such a saturation of media that everything did seem, well, it looks like everybody's doing that. Because if you started to watch TV shows, all of a sudden there's roundhouse kicks appearing and all these things appearing. Um, it was very, very interesting. Yeah. It is. It's funny you bring that up because like when I'm watching the Kevin Sorbo Hercules show and like all the, like you picture the in that in that time frame where that's supposed to be filled. Like these guys aren't doing like wushu moves. They're not doing these roundhouse kicks. All this crazy martial arts stuff. But it's it's funny how it became part of the lexicon, like you said, of these shows. Where it's was that something where they're trying to sell this to the masses, or they realize that hey, these men and women that can actually do these moves are really cool, and maybe just add something to our product. I think it adds something to the product. So it becomes another dimension of fandom. Uh, basically, they already prove, especially in the West through the Bruce Lee media, that, hey, this is a high ticket item. 
um, first probably starting when movies were imported from Hong Kong and, and played in Western theaters and people were actually buying tickets. And then I think that in the mainstream media, they go, well, if there is an audience for that, what if we add uh, components into our current productions? So you started to see it more and more. And I remember being a little bit older and seeing a series like, if you remember, Charmed. Yes. What on earth? They're literally fighting. And it's just like, it's these three ladies and they're literally fighting vampires. And it's full on like martial arts choreography. And now it's so saturated that I think fans of a lot of shows don't realize um, because I've met some that have aversion to martial arts. They're actually watching and consuming martial arts through media. It's interesting too, like when you picture the, the phrase martial arts growing up and even some people now today, I, I think, oh, it's going to be a, a Jason Statham movie or a Tony Jaw or it's be fighting, everything going on. But the arts aspect, if you sit like with your career, when it's gone from, say, Cirque du Soleil or a tour with Tina Turner, the arts aspect of the martial arts is super fascinating because it's got that really cool yin and yang of like the dance, the movements of the physicality of the martial art. It's, it's really cool. You're able to kind of blend into that world. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Not, not too much to say about it, but yeah, it was just an interesting career turn because growing up, um, I think my family was very sport combat oriented. Uh, we, we did boxing, kickboxing and Kempo karate. And, and the main platforms, as you would know, in those arts is not forms. You're going to spar in different rule sets. Um, so the ability to perform martial arts or make somewhat of a career out of that um, was very, very much an unexpected turn. What is like the, when Tina Turner, the production manager calls is like, hey, we want to do this huge 50th anniversary world tour. Not, not many artists have had that type of production. I mean, today they have now, but in terms of dancers and martial arts and that production, you go on YouTube and watch it. It's amazing the amount of work that went into that. But so for like, to grab someone like you or the three or four other martial artists on that production, what's the, what's the process like to try out for something like that? So actually there is no, well, we had what's called a specific audition, but we were already hand chosen. So how that process went is I was in college and I was trying to find ways to keep fit while on campus. So I actually enrolled myself. Uh, first, I tried like a elective yoga and that wasn't really working out. I was like, not quite what I'm looking for. And then I tried ballet and I did ballet bar, which is, uh, seems crazy, but hey, I wanted to try something different. And I had a bit of a hamstring injury at the time. I was looking for ways to rehab. Uh, what had happened is I developed a friendship <clears throat> with the ballet teacher and did a production with her and then threw a friend on that production. They, um, they pitched me to Tina Turner. And basically the pitch went something like the show was being uh, thought of and said, um, you know, Tina, do you want dancers, uh, male dancers? And she says, not really into that. She wanted to have her female dancers. And then they pitched this idea of martial arts ninjas like what if they're male but they're ninjas they move around stage and doing different moves and she was like interesting but i have no clue what that is why don't you show me so then i had a phone call come in and i had the phone call and it says you know blah 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 blah. would you like to work for tina turner i didn't know who it was to be honest I, uh, something jumped in my mind and i go wait tina turner and i remember seeing like a cassette tape as a little child in my family's um house and it said private dancer. And I remember thinking, what is a private dancer? That's so strange. And I was probably like eight years old. And then it popped up, ah, private dancer lady. Sure, I am interested uh, to work with Tina Turner. What had happened then is we rehearsed for a series of weeks under the um, premise that there was no guaranteed job. And basically we're to work on some concepts and then Tina Turner herself is gonna come look at the concept and take us on tour. So that's what happened. Um, we scouted some martial artists from my family school. One was from outside. He was formerly on American Gladiator, the TV show. And Tina Turner came, took a look and said, you guys are going on tour. It's, uh, it's super fascinating too when you hear stories like that because you always see, uh, I'm in that world now, touring security for bands and stuff. And so I get to see the behind the scenes stuff. But hearing someone like you talk about that, it's super cool because it's, again, you watch that now and I'm like, man, these guys are, these are actual ninjas out there doing martial arts. And you're like, you're, you're kind of, if you take out the music aspect of it, it's, it's almost like the, a full workout. It's incredible. You guys like the shape you have to be in to do a show like that. 
it's the choreography evolved and like every maybe if you have pyro and all this other stuff moving on the stage and musicians it's like i don't think people a lot of people realize the amount of work and effort it takes to pull off something like that well definitely but the musicians certainly get a lot of credit because they're up there the entire time and also the the actual dancers who are going through man hundreds and hundreds of uh, beats of choreography per song it's always impressive to me to see um i've been fortunate to be able to perform each time for a few songs or a few minutes and usually my my job's done but the dancers are, are constantly incredible now it seemed like a really cool segue doing that part and then as you jump into like the the Cirque du Soleil stuff with the humanity the idea again of they've never really had martial arts involved uh, before his humanity and the fact that you get kind of brought into kind of like what's that like to be an unknown type of part of a large brand where they're kind of like let's see if we can incorporate your type of martial arts into what we do right so i mean cirque had a little bit of martial arts in the shows well not a little bit they had a martial art numbers in the show ka but as far as i know yeah nothing was in zoomanity and it was one of the artistic directors of Cirque du Soleil named Pierre. And Pierre had this concept that I wanted to have two martial artists um, interacting in the show's humanity. Evidently, uh, they couldn't find another martial artist for the role. But I was, um, I was put on tape years ago. And the funny thing is I actually went to the audition with students of mine and had them audition. But then the casting director, who I corresponded through email for years, egged me on and said, Philip, come on, let me just put you on tape. Just do something for the tape. And it was on a whim that I actually did anything and put it on tape. And it was that audition reel that the um, director saw and invited me to the show. Now, now, from a backstage aspect, it was, I think, a bit strange for the other castmates because all of a sudden there's this new discipline coming on that's not a traditional circus art, nor is it, I think, a recognized performance art for a stage. So they're almost like, what is this guy doing here? What is this guy doing here? And I do remember, um, and it's happened time to time throughout my life, is the director actually called up the cast, which he's never done before, and told me to demonstrate my skills in front of the entire cast. And that was almost like, I think, a way of ensuring acceptance from the get-go. Um, and I met my wife, who's a contortionist. She was a contortionist on that show. And she had said that she never saw that done for any other artists where they actually called everybody in specifically to watch me do something. And why do you think that is? Is, is it just the narrow mindedness or people are so in tune with what they do with their, their aspect of the show that they're not realizing that there is other art forms out there that obviously aren't mainstream per se, but something like martial arts, you would think that like, and I gotta get like, I've, I've seen the show, I've seen a bunch of the, the, the stuff that Cirque du Soleil puts out there, and it's the Zubani one. It's just without the martial arts aspect or these type of men and women that do what you guys do, the show wouldn't be the, what it is today. And I think that's a testament to the skills and the trust that someone like Pierre put into hey, let's try to implement this, right? Um, well, I, I think that what happens is it starts to become a different movement pattern, which becomes um interesting for the audience, but unknown for the other performers. Because if you're used to dissecting a specific style of movement, sometimes other styles of movement seem incorrect. So for instance, foot position and dance, maybe you'll turn out your toes when you do a type of a squatting uh, position, but a horse dance will, will have the toes forward and um, that increases ankle mobility, but has other benefits as well. A dancer will look at that and say, oh my gosh, what are you doing? I remember I was warming up one time and a dancer was like, I don't understand, how are you doing that? Or um, what a dancer would call sickling the foot, which is where you turn in the foot, knife edge, and uh, maybe when you lift up one leg. And a lot of martial arts will know you do that, quote unquote, to protect the groin, to protect the knee, or maybe uh, depending on the movement, you're hooking someone's leg. So you're actually coiling around someone's leg as you're balancing on one leg. You would push forward like a takedown. Um, so in a lot of those moves, we wouldn't use a point, which dancers are often taught because of aesthetic, we always want a point. Um, so I think those little details would make the art less appealing visually for some. When I, sometimes when I watch productions like that, I, I'm kind of like, if I was, obviously, if I was at the level of whoever was, contortionist, uh, martial art, whatever the aspect of that show was, I don't know how I'd not be distracted by what else is going on. Like, how do you get, like, it's one thing training and practicing your moves, but with other stuff's going on in the show and people are swinging around doing this other stuff. 
how hard, like how hard is it to get into that role where it's like mentally you can't be distracted by anything? Well, I mean, it's just, you have to recognize other people's skill and, and always it's respectful, but it's easy to also get jaded when it's 10 times a day, you're going to see it or 10 times a week, you're going to see the people warming up. I mean, of course, the first week there's a certain uh, shock that you'll see all these amazing artists. And I remember when I first watched the show, it was very inspiring uh, to see just the pure strength athleticism that people brought with different types of disciplines. And definitely I learned a lot by just watching them warm up, watching them warm up. Um, and people, my wife for one would say that when she was a, a young child, her, her coach for contortion would tell her not to let others see her warm up because you would learn the secrets of, of the art. And in the same way in martial arts, we have that in the past. I mean, of course, YouTube generation, it's different, but there are different training methods for each art that make it very unique. So what I personally try to do is I still have a little bit of that in my personality is I would actually go to a, a corner of the um, backstage that's not as occupied and I would just warm up there constantly and just mm. move, 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 maybe put some headphones on and move. What is the process for, say, Zubanity, hey, you're locked into a contract. Is it like, are you treated as a, is it like a salary? I mean, I don't really get the, the specifics of it, but like in terms of, are you a contractor with Cirque du Soleil? Do you work full time for them? Like, how does it work? Are you able to do other stuff outside of that production? So there's different tiers of contract, but generally speaking, uh, you're an employed artist with the company. Uh, that's if you're a full-time uh, artist for the company, which I was uh, for a number of years. So that means that you get a contract and it says you're not allowed to perform in other gotcha. venues. Um, you have a fixed salary that's associated with a, a specific show fee. So you have um, sick days, different stuff like that. Yeah. You have uh, vacations. Uh, at the time that I was in, there's paid vacations. I don't know about now because there's restructuring in the company. Um, yeah. So basically you are an right. employed artist for the company and biannually. So every six months you have to do a physical test and um, you have to maintain a certain level of baseline fitness uh, to keep your role. If you fall below a certain athlete, um, athletic level, you might get docked pay or taken out of the show in terms of like, you'll be put back into what they call a rehearsal uh, show wage, which means that they are training you to be fit to perform again. And that also can happen if you get injured. We do have insurance through the company, but if you were to get injured, Cirque uh, has been really great because I saw them rehab a number of artists um, and help them get back into shows. It's all, and I also love that a company has high standards too, because to be at that level, you have to have a le some sort of, hey, we need to stay professional. And, no, and I love that. So backstage, we had physical therapists. Uh, we had uh, personal trainers if we wanted. Uh, so maybe twice a week, you, you get a masseuse, yep. uh, different stuff like that uh, at Cirque. Now, when you're doing the Cirque du Soleil stuff and the like Tina Turner type stuff or another pro, like whatever, you're the core basis why you're there, the martial arts, how much time are you able to still give enough time to training for a specific martial art on your own uh, where it doesn't hamper the, the production of, say, a, a tour or Cirque du Soleil? Like, how much time do you still dedicate to your actual martial art as well? Well, so to be perfectly honest, it, it can be difficult, but it, for me, anytime I tour or perform, it's refinement of, of skill sets that you might have learned before. So gotcha. oftentimes... Um, when you're training and depends on the coach, you might be constantly given material. And sometimes it's an oversaturation, if you will, um, of that material. So I say you have to receive it and then digest it. So I felt like in the time that I get to perform, there's a lot of refinement going on and just fine tuning physically. And then that allows me to understand something on a deeper level because I get more time. And plus, of course, you're getting your repetition in always performing at a high level every day. So for instance, in Cirque, you're going twice a night, uh, five days a week. So whatever you're performing is definitely like, I did double swords pretty frequently over there and uh, whip, which is something I've done for like 15 years. But awesome. when, when I do it, I don't think I would even get the same experience doing that in a dojo per se, or in a gym or a park, because you have to do it live, you know, with full power, with full intensity. So I think that there's a certain level of improvement. Now, the opposition to that is 
I would be uh, less likely again to try a new movement uh, because of risk of injury right. or maybe if I had a training partner that I didn't trust right to spar with or to roll with or to do some type of work um, I remember that there was a time in my life when I was practicing jujitsu and wushu at the same time and those were my two emphasized arts I already did a lot of striking but I ultimately chose to focus on the wushu more because it was employing me. It was starting to employ me. And I do have uh, two tears in my left knee meniscus and it would get infl inflamed through the rolling of jujitsu. So I was like, oh man, I should probably choose one or the other. So um, I ended up choosing a certain career path. Although right. when I went to Vegas, I did a little bit of catch wrestling with a, a, a buddy down here. And it's pretty cool art to catch wrestling. But same thing, I had to go, man, I got 10 shows a week. I have to be careful. Yeah. So when well, you did that for three years, and then you transitioned as a t into an like, instructor or a choreographer for the show, was that mm -hmm. a different Was that a different feeling for you? Like now you're the one kind of in charge of finding someone to be the next you. Like how, what was that kind of like that mindset for you leading into that? It was a little weird because, yeah, the, the people that I was in charge of coaching first are people who are going to take over my role. So right. you get to see them try on like the same costume and do the same stuff. And you're like, whoa, that's pretty weird. Um, for me, it wasn't that bad because usually I, I do a year contract wherever I go or something like this. But Zoo was about three, as you said. So I guess I wasn't overly attached to the idea of um, this is my identity. But it was a bit strange to, to uh, integrate people. And, and sometimes you're working with a really similar choreography that I, I kind of quote unquote created or performed, but I, I got to integrate about three artists into that show. And then each artist was a little bit different ending with the last one who was super creative and bringing his own element. It's something like wushu. Like you don't, I could think of maybe one to two places where I've ever driven by or even walked by where I see like the wushu Academy or somewhere on the side. And it's one of those things where it's like, you always see the jujitsu or the judo or like, and not to knock the other ones, but like an art like Wushu, is that something where part of your legacy is to make sure that there's a new Philip coming down the line or a, 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 a kid's kid that's coming down that's going to carry on the legacy of all the greats that have done Wushu? Um, I'm not overly attached to, let's say, sport Wushu, which is the forms and, and the performance of it. I'm more interested in Wushu as the historical term martial arts. The core term, as you know, Wushu just means martial arts, everybody. So being that my family raised me to be open-minded, um, as I mentioned, a little bit of jujitsu and not saying I'm good at it, but I have done jujitsu, kickboxing, boxing, stick fighting, different type of stuff. There's a lot of beautiful arts out there. So when I, in my school, when I use wushu as a term, I use Chinese martial arts as a method to develop the body. So as some people may know, Kung Fu, which is possibly a more popular term, has nothing to do with martial arts, right? It's a, the skill of a human being over time. And actually, Fu is the character like a father, like Fu Qing. But I don't like to tell people that because it seems overly masculine. But if you take it, it's um, the character of human with like two lines on top, which I, in my mind, put it as like ascension, which may be wrong for a, a Mandarin speaker, but this is how I kind of identify. Also in martial arts, we have degrees of a belt. So I like to visualize like those are the degrees of ascension, which is change, transformation. So why is that important? Because Kung Fu sometimes gets a bad rap saying, oh, the Kung Fu guys can't fight. Well, actually, the first part is just, again, conditioning. If you fight with conditioning, it would be rather silly, right? right. If you, if you were, try to apply jumping jacks or push-ups or sit-ups to a fight, it, it is a bit silly, but it's called preparation. So we use uh, wushu stretching, stance work, movement, uh, to improve the coordination of the body. Because when I began Wushu, I quickly realized that this is one of the hardest martial art forms I've ever tried from a physicality standpoint. And then it did serve to benefit my understanding of all the martial arts skill sets that came prior. Um, so I still teach actually some other methods at our school. So I have some of my family's boxing methods or kicking methods, um, throws, and what we call Kempo techniques too, sprinkled around the curriculum. Um, but that's taught at a middle level because to me, 
all that may be ineffective if a person didn't come with the base set of coordination, balance, and bravery. And you're referring to the case star, your training academy. Is yeah, that yeah. something? Is that, teaching, some, yeah. is that something that obviously the last two years with stuff shut down and the pandemic and everything? Were you guys able to kind of push through with that, or you kind of adapt to like Zoom teachings and stuff like that? Well, thank goodness we were able to adapt. I mean, this was kind of my wife and I's exit strategy because you can't perform forever. And um, I didn't like the idea to perform with the uncertainty of a contract getting pulled anytime. And that started to happen. Um, Some people in the shows that I was working at who performed amazingly, all of a sudden just got their contract taken uh, without any warning, basically, because we knew bad behavior could happen. We knew um, if you slip below athletic uh, ability, that could happen. But all of a sudden, people at their prime uh, just getting the contract taken. And I start to go, whoa, 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 that's looking dicey, which was a good move because uh, during the pandemic, Zumanity closed. Right. So I wouldn't have had a job after anyways as a coach or whatever. Um, so upon building our exit strategy, the talk was, hey, hon, either I'm going to go try to get into film, which some of my peers are, yep. or I'm going to teach some classes. That's basically it. Uh, so we decided to open a studio and thankfully we found a great space, um, just close to the Las Vegas airport, like nearby the airport. So very centrally located and, uh, we're teaching, we made it through pandemic, but we were open and three months later we had to shut down because of it. So uh, of course it was a bit nerve wracking, but we made it through. It's, uh, it's interesting because a lot of people I know that have ran these studios, Keith Cook was one of them, or uh, Benny the Jet, uh, he had a studio that closed down because of it. And all these different martial arts, it's like the one thing when you talk to them, it's they notice not only the physical aspect of why people do this, but for the mental health release that martial arts provide to men and women, kids, older, younger. And it's, it's one of those things too where it's like it, you were fortunate there's people like you out there or your wife, they're kind of like, really tried your best to instill this type of almost like a safety for people where they can feel confident, uh, but also get the mental and physical type of exercises they need. I definitely, I think it's helped keep me centered because as a child, I was a bit problematic for my family and uh, <laughs> the training, the training definitely helped find a balance. Um, and probably the biggest balancing point was when I went to China for the first time and I was 17 years old I already had training and stuff but then I was like whoa they do it pretty hard over here and somehow you get addicted to training and kind of realizing that it's about self-improvement rather than just getting a skill and I think when your mind shifts to just enjoying the process of training not for the sake of achievement meaning not for the sake of gaining something just the habit of doing you become happy because that enters a flow state where you're just enjoying in the moment. With the culturally in China, the martial arts is viewed so much. I, I love watching all like even Netflix now has like the different uh, languages. And so I'll go and watch all like these with a VPN, like all the shows there where it's very martial arts heavy, very dance choreography. And I've always wondered why that never really carried over here. And like, I, I wish there was a show called like Jackie Chan's disciple here. Or, and so it's like when you do a show like that, it's like it just shows you the magnitude of martial arts or someone like Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee that people of all backgrounds can kind of gravitate towards. And again, I just wish America or even all around the world just put martial arts at like a higher level or premium. It just, it's, for me, I get so mad. And I love all the action movies with the martial arts. And it's all, I mean, some of the stuff's so over the top, baloney. Right. Right. Part of me loves it. But the other side is like, I wish people understood that martial arts is more than just a choreographed uh, 12 on one fight scene with nunchucks. Like there's more to it than that. And it's like, you actually got to see a part of that over there with that show. That had to have been pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, The main thing with media, of course, is it reflects culture and society. So martial arts, at least the martial arts that are common have a long practice period through let's say Asia. um, But also of course we have the Knights in Europe. So you have some media there that's technically reflective of those martial arts because they're period uh, television shows associated with that. However, it's not maybe what we expect to be in Chinese martial arts, Filipino or whatever style martial art. Um, In the West, I guess it would be the Cowboys. (laughs) That's reflective of the Western culture at the time, right? Because the earliest Western culture, at least um, the assimilation of such, 
is people came over with guns, whether those was muskets or quickly became other types of pistol. I don't think we've seen a cowboy that's a martial artist yet. I let, well, may, I mean, no, not really. Maybe David Kung Fu. David yeah. Right. Uh, he was the he was a cowboy and uh, Billy Jack. Billy Jack and then Walker, Texas Ranger. He yes, was a, yes. a cowboy. But I'm uh, saying that. But I'm saying that um, because all the other arts were imported, right? 1950s. Right. The true culture reflective is going to be on the railroad bank robberies and on the heisting and all that stuff because that's part of the historical development of United States. So I think um, it's not as ingrained in the culture to see that versus a place like China where they had martial arts documented for right. hundreds and possibly thousands of years. How chaotic is a show like America's Got Talent it, leading up to like, I mean, you made all the way to the semifinals. So in those earlier rounds of those tryouts, like what they show you on TV, and I'm very familiar with what, how they edit stuff, but it, it's always still looks super chaotic. And like, how, is, how difficult was it to get through those earlier rounds just dealing with the minutia of a production like that? Um, it was a bit strange because of something called B-roll footage. Yes. So B-roll footage is always a bit strange to me because you're given a, a guidelines of what to say and what to do. And kind of they build a narrative around you. And sometimes uh, you don't want to build a narrative, you know? So if you don't say certain things or do certain things, then maybe um, you'll be edited a certain way or not featured as much. But in general, I enjoyed the America's Got Talent process because it gave us a platform to do something fun. And um, what happened with that, it was such, such a whim decision to go on America's Got Talent. And this wasn't something that producers reached out for. I literally saw a newspaper as I was flying to Germany. Like I was flying to Germany the next day. And I saw a newspaper that said, America's Got Talent auditions. And I thought, hmm. I have a hankering for doing something because uh, I haven't done something in a while. The Tina Turner tour closed in 2009 and this was uh, early 2010. But before that, I'd done a, a string of stuff since 2006. And I said, how about that will be the one now? So I told some students and a friend of mine, hey, why don't you guys go to the audition and just meet the producers? They did that. And then we were invited to do the first actual filming. As soon as I got back from Europe, I joined them and we did the choreography together. And that was that. But yeah, it's just a, a good opportunity to use a platform to enhance yourself and showcase an art. It's nice. You had mentioned that there was, you kind of thought maybe if it wasn't teaching, maybe get to the movies. And how, like, I am curious, like, for someone like you that with the talents and skills you have, like, isn't there a place, wouldn't there be a place for someone like you? Or like, I can't imagine there's that many people like you that are fight choreographers or someone, a specific show or, a movie where it's like, like I could, I could kind of picture you either playing the good guy, the bad guy, like whoever it is, like there's certain roles out there for people like you that sometimes I think they just give to people because they look pretty or they look handsome. It's like, do you want the real deal? Or it's always all these movies do like these fan castings where it's like, Oh, right. Scott Atkins should be this guy. Well, he should be if you want the true character of this combo character, but they're not going to pick him because he can't, he doesn't talk right. Or he doesn't look the part. It's, it's super right. fascinating to me. Yeah, there's many uh, aspects about the casting process and selection. And sometimes it's just one opinion, which is amazing. And then other times there's multiple opinions, right? You have the directors, the producers, and the casting director. There's, there's many choices. Um, for me, myself, I was not very interested in the concept of performing on film and, and cameras and television. Uh, by nature, I was quite shy and rather introverted as a child. And all through my training, I remember e even in my 20s, which is a bit older, I wouldn't even like to train in my own studio. I would run to the park nearby my studio and practice and hopefully no one was around because I didn't like extra eyes on me. Um, and I felt that if I started to move, people were like trying to watch. And that was never comfortable for me. So therefore the thought of putting a camera in my face, lights in my face, and then saying perform, that was, um, always a bit of a um, not as enticing as right. an offer as just training per se but as things came in I just kind of fell into the line of, of opportunity that came my way and used different things to challenge myself I remember you know just doing a show 
and there's only like 60 people and that seems like a big deal, then all of a sudden, years later, I'm in front of like 40,000 and you go, okay, I'm still here, but I'm still also nervous in a way. Right. I'm never super, super confident. Uh, always a little piece of me is nervous, but I think that's because you care, right? You start mm-hmm. to care. Right. You can kind of go back to your schooling a little bit here. If, if I'm a kid or whoever wants to come there, what's the process like? Is it like one of those things where you walk in there and you already kind of know what you're going to be doing or like, Hey, I want to try this out. Or do you, like, do you, do you just accept people or do you kind of have to look at this person and be like, is this person going to really want to learn or are they just doing this because they want to get in trouble or something like that? Thankfully, when people kind of see the media that we put out, I think they right. already have an expectation of what they're going to do. And sometimes there's an acceptance of they can or cannot do it. And I'm not saying that meaning potential wise, I'm just talking about personal interest, right? Um, and for instance, we have some students who are a bit older and they're doing fine. They're in the classes, but then we have some who come to the front door and just say, that's not for me. Um, I try to be transparent. So let's say just recently, a parent came in with their child. The child liked the idea of doing combat and, and moving and defending, but didn't like the idea of exercise. But for me to make a strong athlete or a, let's say the best martial artist possible, we start with fitness and we start with flexibility training, strength training, because that would allow them to move with a larger range of motion and therefore provide them with the ability to perform more techniques. If someone comes into our academy and spends some time, it's my hope that at least they walk away with more than just move, uh, moves that maybe they could use on somebody, but rather a adjustment to their approach of lifestyle. And maybe there's some physical attributes that they can adapt and change into another art form. Not everybody wants to do martial arts. So I often uh, will say, if you are interested, let's do a little like 15 minute trial with myself or one of my coaches. And we move around with them encourage them to watch a class then the second step is they try a class and then from there they could decide to become a student or not um we're really lenient in the beginning meaning that they could just buy a pack of five classes and that's it they're they're to come in try five and there's multiple factors to them uh staying on one is for child maybe it's behavior uh two it's the parents getting them there and then three and then three it's interest you know right Because maybe in the schedule of the family, they just don't have the ability or the desire to get the child there frequently or or enough for them to actually learn material. That's that's kind of why I asked, because I'm like, for someone like you, you put so much passion into it. I mean, you come from a family of it. And to see someone, the yin and yang of that, where you see someone that doesn't give a crap about it versus the person that's so passionate and will do everything they can to be there. Like that type of person must make you feel good because you feel like the time you're putting in, and even the extra time, you're going to make a difference in this person's life. Right. But usually I don't hold that expectation to others because they don't have the interest gotcha. level that I have. Right. right. It's, it's um, a interest of accumulating 30, 30 something years since I've started training. Cause I started so young. Um, I can't expect to hold that over somebody else. So if they don't have the same level of uh, passion or desire to train, I I can't hold that. uh, I cannot hold them personally accountable for not having the same intensity as myself. Right. So usually for the kids or for other people, I say, if you fall out of interest, like it's okay, don't feel like you have to come and not in this studio yet. But when I coach at my family studio, there is occasions when I tell parents like, your kid doesn't like it. So please, like, they don't have to train. Right. Um, because it has to be a, a, an interest and it has to be a balance between the coach, the student, and if it's a minor, the adult to all foster this growth. If there is no interest in growth by any one of the parties, even if myself as a coach does not feel like teaching the individual, I should step back and not become the coach. Right. It's, it's fascinating too. You do the coaching for a Cirque du Soleil, you do the coaching for the, the, your academy. It's like, how have you changed as a coach? Is it, is it different for you coaching people that are obviously older for Cirque du Soleil versus children or younger generation people? Like, have you noticed a sense of how you coach change at all? I think so. When I was uh, um, coaching before, I maybe had 
a drawn out roadmap for a long-term plan. And then if a student backs out of a long-term plan, sometimes not even knowing that they're part of a long-term plan, <laughs> uh, I would be like, oh man, that student, wow, they could have been something or this or that. But as um, the requirement became shorter and shorter, meaning the job requirement, for instance, I need you to take this individual and make them look a certain way within a period of weeks. It's okay to work with someone even short term because hopefully you'll give them something that can affect right. their ability to move, think, or feel that they'll carry on uh, to get a job done. And in many ways, I work with, uh, for instance, just this week, I went to a stage show here in town and I was helping coach people how to punch on stage, like how to do stage combat kind of movement. And you're just basically interacting with these people for half an hour or an hour. And then they're rotating, giving me another person and another person and another person. But you try to be authentic to each person as much as possible. And hopefully they can absorb something from it. But you treat them the exact same way as you would a student who's been with you for five years or some, because they deserve that professionalism. Right. If someone wants to, like, how would someone reach out to you or your academy? Is this something on social media, a website? Like if someone was like, is listening to this, it will be like, Hey, maybe my daughter or my son, or maybe I want to do this. Like, how do they, what's the process for kind of reaching out and getting involved? Uh, so you can go to the website, which is kstarlv.com. The Instagram handle is at kstarlv and uh, just follow us or send us a message. But I encourage everyone who's interested, you know, get a sense of what martial arts is or what it can be about and find a school or a coach that inspires you first. Um, and if you desire to quote unquote, do something with the art, meaning that could just mean get a black belt. That could just mean improve your uh, physicality or be a pro fighter or be a performer, work in entertainment, try to find a coach that aligns with your uh, goals and try to work with them. And of course, make sure that they have faith in you and they can help bring you up. If they don't, you might need to find a new coach. No, it's great advice. Well, thank you, Philip, for this. Uh, it's been awesome. Uh, talking to you, learning about your life and career. And uh, I wish you all the success, especially as the world opens up and hopefully more and more people head to the training academy and you uh, you and your wife have a safe rest of the year and uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Thank you very much. Have a great day and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you Philip. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the Chop Fit. Over the course of the past year, the Chop Fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourself as well. If you use this code, SPEARCHOP10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SPEARCHOP10 for $10 off your Chop Fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you.